let's go ahead and actually get started here. Um, it's time to introduce our first scientist. Uh, Dr. Michael Scott Smith is a scientific research group leader at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's a distinguished scientist with PhD in physics from Yale University, specializes in nuclear astrophysics. Dr. Smith is going to talk to us today about Big Bang and expanding our universe. So go ahead and welcome up Dr. Michael Scott Smith. Well, thank you very much for coming. Really excited that we had such a great turnout today. And I'm really happy to be here and talk to you about science and also the science that I do. But first, I'm going to start off a little bit and kind of give you an idea about why you might want to do scientific research as a career. Some sort of personality traits that may make it really interesting for you to choose science. And one, of course, is being curious. You want to ask questions about the world around you. You're not happy with someone just telling you the way things are. You want to know how things work. What is the world made of? What's there? Maybe you want to discover something new, something that no one has ever seen before. I know I had that feeling that life is more than what's in the textbooks. There's some new stuff out there. Uh, maybe you want to change the way that we think about the world. And I'll give you a specific example about that, about how we think about the entire universe. I'll show you how one person changed the way we think about the universe in, in a very simple way. Maybe you like to solve puzzles, and there's lots and lots of puzzles out there, and I'll mention some of those today that I hope you're interested in solving because we need bright young minds to attack these problems and solve them. Uh, maybe you want to make a better world. There's so many things that need to be invented, so many new technologies that we need to bring our world into the future. You may be the ones who actually want to do that. And maybe you want to do that science and also train the next generation of young scientists. I really love working with students. We have high school students, college, uh, graduate students, young PhDs that all work in my research group. And it's so exciting, especially in the summer times, to have an influx of new students coming in with new ideas and new approaches to solving certain problems. Uh, maybe you want to go to work and not do the same thing every day. Maybe you want a new challenge. Well, I get that. I mean, I've been doing this science now for 28 years, and every day is a little bit different than the next day. And some days are radically different. I love that part about, uh, about my job. And one of the best things is to get to work with very, very smart people. I'm surrounded by smart people all the time, interact with them very closely. Science is a team effort. It's not just one person in a quiet little room thinking about things. Working together is really fun, uh, especially with the really smart people. And I've been extremely fortunate to be able to go around the world and lecture and collaborate with scientists. So that top picture is me giving a lecture last fall in October. And in fact, I just got back last night about midnight uh, from China, uh, giving some lectures over there. And uh, at the bottom is another group of me having dinner with some international scientists. I really have loved the friends and connections that I've made around the world. And that's part of my job, is to go around the world and do experiments and work with people like that. Now, what field of science would you be interested in working in? There's many, many choices, OK? Perhaps biology is one. Perhaps you like snakes and slugs and beetles and uh, uh, all sorts of things like that, creepy crawly things. Uh, maybe chemistry, you like to blow things up. And that's actually how I got interested in science in the first place. Uh, a neighbor of mine had a home chemistry kit. And his parents had made him throw it away because I think he did something uh, maybe that, a little bit dangerous. I found it in the trash bin. I kind of brought it into my basement, and I ended up in a week uh, setting part of my basement on fire. And that was just got me, I thought, just by mixing a couple things and, and maybe a source of ignition uh, allowed me to do some really fun things in the house. My parents didn't like it. They threw it away. But that got me started off doing a little bit of science or trying to do science. Maybe you like earth science, something we live on the earth. You'd like to study something about the earth. Learn about how it's put together. Learn about how it can fall apart like this. Uh, but I do physics. We ask some of the most fundamental questions. How is the universe made? How do particles get their mass? What kind of particles are out there? It's a really, really exciting field. I love it very much. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of flavor today of some of the physics that I do and some of my colleagues do. And just a few pictures. I get to do so many different things in my job. Uh, this picture on the upper left is me working on our atom smasher that we have at the laboratory. We have to polish that twice a year to keep the outer edges very, very smooth because we're bringing up to 25 million volts. 
And any time there's a sharp edge, it acts like a lightning rod and gives a spark over to the rest of the chamber. And then I have meetings, a picture on the bottom right of me going to Washington and begging for money so we can get new, uh, so we can bring in new students and postdocs into our research program. So I've been able to do, uh, go to fantastic places and do really a wide variety of things. Now, let me talk a little bit about the science that I do that I really find fascinating and I call this the Big Bang and our expanding universe. And maybe you'll learn a couple of things new about the universe that you didn't know. And here's a few of the things that scientists are now thinking about the universe. One is that when did the universe start? It started about 14 billion years ago in, some, in a very hot fireball called the Big Bang, or the hot Big Bang. That's sort of an artist's conception of this, all the matter and energy in the universe in one point and then blowing out into space. And that blowing out and expansion actually is continuing today. That's something that a lot of people don't know, that the universe today is actually bigger than it was yesterday. And tomorrow, it's going to be a little bit bigger than it is today. And a lot of people don't know that. And I'm going to go through the argument, the original person who discovered that, named Edwin Hubble, to show you what, how he found that that was true with a relatively simple set of observations. Uh, so that's a really fascinating thing. Not only is it getting bigger, but the rate at which it's getting bigger is getting faster and faster and faster. And I'll tell you why that is so unusual. We attribute that to a mysterious force that we call dark energy. We call it dark energy because we actually don't know what it is. Scientists love to give a fancy name to something that they don't really understand. And plus the name sounds pretty cool, and so lots of theorists write papers about it and trying to figure out what this mysterious dark energy is. And dark energy is going to cause something called the big rip. The entire fabric of space and time and everything in it, bodies, planets, star systems, galaxies, superclusters of galaxies, will all be ripped apart long, long in the future. And that's all due to dark energy, this mysterious force which is pulling things, pushing things apart. So uh, that's some of the ideas that we have about space and time. And not only do we think we have the universe that we live in right now, which of course is an amazing place, but there are many people who think there's something called the multiverse, multiple universes, each of which have their own planets, their own stars, their own galaxies, their own clusters of galaxies. Multiple universes or multiverse theory is very popular among theorists these days, trying to understand what the nature of that is. How can we even understand if there's more than one universe? We know the one that we're in, and we're trying to understand it better, but there might be more than one, okay? So scientists around the world are trying to study these topics, and it's really amazingly fun to, and intellectually stimulating to work with these researchers and try to understand what's happening, okay? What kind of tools do we use? We use satellites that are up in space. We also use supercomputers, uh, like this is the Titan supercomputer that's at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, one of the world's fastest supercomputers we get to use for some of our simulations. Uh, we have an atom smasher. It's the world's most powerful electrostatic uh, accelerator that's right there on campus in Oak Ridge. We've used that for uh, over 20 years for our sort of research. And of course, we try to use a lot of brain power. Now, I don't know how many of you know this gentleman. His name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's one of the most uh, uh, well-known uh, astrophysics uh, uh, speech, speech givers and uh, uh, presenters and, um, of course, researcher as well. And he has written many books, and he was actually uh, head of this uh, or ran this uh, Cosmos TV program a number of years ago. Fantastic scientist and especially someone who popularizes the ideas of astrophysics notions uh, for the world. And then Lisa Randall, I wanted to point out, I met her once. She is a, a theoretical physicist from Harvard. She's been, uh, she's been known for being the most cited theoretical physicist uh, in the planet. Cited means more scientists reference her work than have referenced any other physicist. That's an incredible title. She's written a number of popular books about the physics that she does, uh, about warp space-time and strange particles and black holes. Very interesting research that she does. And of course, many of you have heard about Stephen Hawking. He unfortunately died this past spring, but he was the master of black holes. He gave us incredible insights into black holes and the physics surrounding these very exotic, uh, very exotic elements or uh, 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 systems in space. So now let me give you an idea about how we study some of these topics, expansion of space and the nature of our universe. 
So the, the study of the expansion of space began in 1929 with Edwin Hubble. This is him sitting at the, um, at the focus of Mount Palomar or, or Mount Wilson Observatory just outside of Los Angeles. And he was interested in two things. He was interested in looking at stars and seeing how far away they are and seeing how fast they move. Okay, how did he do that? Well, first, I want to need one volunteer from the audience to come up. Uh, please, somebody come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This won't hurt too much. It might hurt a little. I like to bring people down for, for some of these interactive demonstrations, kind of see if science is not so crazy, it's not so distant. Okay, so estimating distance. How do you tell how far away something is, okay? So I want you to stand right there, and I have my flashlight app on my phone. Okay, I'm gonna shine this in your eye. You tell me if it's bright or dim. It's bright. Bright, right? Now tell me if it gets brighter or dimmer as I walk away. Dimmer. She's saying dimmer. Dimmer, louder? Dimmer. dimmer, 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 right? So in some ways, you could probably tell how far away I am by how bright this light is to you, right? As I'm getting twice as far as going to be maybe actually one over, four, one over two squared, one quarter time as bright. Okay, so that is a way, and that same thing that Hubble did to try to find how far stars are. Imagine she's Edwin Hubble, and this is a star. So Hubble is seeing these stars at different brightnesses, and he's telling that's how far away they are. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our volunteer coming in. Okay, that's simple idea. What about, uh, what about, so fainter, something that's fainter or dimmer is farther away. Simple idea. What about speed? Okay. You've probably heard that before, right? Siren coming towards you has a higher pitch. Siren going away from you has a lower pitch. The same thing is true with light. A light source that's moving away from you gets sort of stretched out and the wavelength gets longer and it turns to be red. A little bit more red, it's called a red shift. So Hubble used that to tell how fast the stars are moving away from us. And then he did this thing. He said, I'm gonna look at a whole bunch of stars and I'm gonna see their speed and I'm gonna see their distance. And this is what he found. He started plotting out these different um, these different stars, and so distance is plotted here and speed, and he's plotting these out, plot, 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 each one a different star, and eventually he gets all of them and he puts a line through them that looks like a straight line relation, a linear relationship between distance and speed. And so what he found was his rule is that the farther away a star is, the faster away it's moving from us. Okay, so these stars, they're moving away in all directions, and the farther away, the faster they are. And I studied that. I saw that picture first time in college. And the teacher said something about what this implied, and I didn't really understand it. I saw it as a PhD student, and I really didn't understand it. It wasn't until much later that I really tried to understand and started to understand what this law meant. So I want to try to show it to you, give you an idea of how scientists think, and they can make a jump from a plot like this to telling something about the entire universe. Okay, so what does Hubble's law mean? For this, I need two volunteers. Quickly, you and you. Yeah, quickly, quickly, quickly. This one might hurt a little bit more, but we'll see. Okay, so I am going to be the reference observer. Please come in here. You are each going to be a star. And my foot, my foot is not that big, okay? Ooh. My foot is not that big, but I'm going to pretend that each of my feet is the size of one megaparsec, which is a long distance in space, okay? So, I'm going to take you, what's your name? Nathan. Nathan, I can see it right in this tag, okay? Nathan's going to be star A, okay? So I'm going to go five, five megaparsecs away from me. One, two, three, four, five, come with me, okay? So he's five megaparsecs away, okay? And you are Caitlin. Caitlin, come here. You're going to be ten megaparsecs away from me, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Great. Okay, so we got the simple arrangement. Two stars, star A, star B. Okay, We've, he's five megaparsecs, she's ten megaparsecs. What does that plot tell us about how these stars are moving from us, right? Remember Hubble's law is telling us that star B, she, Caitlin, has twice the speed or velocity 
and star A. Okay? So now, I'm going to observe these stars a little bit later. Okay? A second observation. I'm going to wait until Nathan has moved 10 more megaparsecs away from me. Okay? So right now he's five. Let's take Nathan on a little stroll through space. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, six. Watch your step. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? He's now 10 more. In that, in that dis, uh, in, uh, distance in time, he has moved 10 more megaparsecs. Okay? So that's a good thing. And then I go to this plot. And I say the second observation, Nathan is 15 megaparsecs away, right? 5 plus 10, 15, okay? But what happened to Caitlin? What happened to star B during that time? Okay, star B, she has twice the speed of star A. So how much did she move? He moved 10, so she moved 20. Okay, okay, so let's go on a little walk, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then 20. Don't be scared. It's actually really dark in there, so don't be too scared. Okay, so she moved 20. Oh, well, let's let her out a little bit. Okay, you come out here, but let's pretend that, let's move all the way to the corner here, all the way here. Let's pretend that she's 20 away. We won't keep her in the dark all that time. Okay, so she has moved 20, obviously. It's a very simple thing. So now she is 30 megaparsecs away, okay? So Nathan's 15, Caitlin is 30, okay? So what's happened to our system? Initially, she was twice as far as he was. And now, still, she's twice as far as, she is, as he is. Okay? 30 megaparsecs versus 15. That's just because of Hubble's law. What does that tell us? That is the exact definition of uniform expansion. That tells us that the space is expanding in all directions at the same rate. Space looks the same, okay? but it's bigger by a factor of two. That's the meaning of that simple plot with that one line. So that's how the scientists are connecting this one picture of the data points on a graph with what's actually happening in our world, okay? So let's thank our volunteers very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, that was called the first cosmology revolution. That's why I wanted to tell you that one guy making these observations totally changed our idea about the universe. At that point, everybody thought the universe was the universe. It wasn't moving. It wasn't growing. It wasn't shrinking. It was just the universe. He made these measurements, now everybody knows that it's expanding. That's an amazing sort of result, okay? Now the question is, does Hubble's law, that's called that Hubble's law, does it hold at larger distances? Because his telescopes were not so powerful. Now we have much more powerful telescopes to do that, and they found this amazing result way up here, that, um, that extending Hubble's law, let me see if I get my pointer here. Oh, yeah going up to stars that are a farther distance away, the stars no longer follow this dotted green line, which was Hubble's law. They actually look like this. And no one expected that to happen. That means the stars are farther away, are actually moving faster and faster and faster. That's a crazy idea. Now, why is that crazy? That means the expansion of the universe is not going steadily, getting bigger, 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 bigger. It's actually speeding up. Now that alone may say, seem interesting, but it's actually more than interesting. It's totally puzzling, okay? And here's the reason. I need two volunteers for this. Uh, you and way in the back. You. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, four people got up, okay. <laughs> quickly, quickly. Okay. This one might hurt the most, just a warning. Because I've got a prop. Please hold one in. Very good. Ryan and Maddie. Maddie. Okay. Now, Ryan and Maddie are going to be simulating the entire universe. First, they're going to come together here and stand back to back. This is the notion of the hot Big Bang. The universe is expanding very fast. So you're going to be expanding very fast, except we'll kind of do it in slow motion. So you're moving apart, moving apart, moving apart. Now, what is this chord? This chord represents the universal law of gravitation, which, now let's pretend they're not stars. Let's pretend they're any piece of matter. You pull the chord a little taut. Now, universal law of gravitation means that you are going to be attracting Maddie, so pull, pull in a little bit. No, you do this. Yeah, hand over hand. Here, keep it tight. Hand over hand, pull her in. Pull her in. Pull, pull, pull. At the same time, now go, you hold the end. At the same time, she is attracting uh, Ryan, now you pull him in, hand over hand, okay? That's the universal law of gravitation. Every two things pull on each other. 
okay? Now, what's surprising about the universe? Let's go back to the Big Bang, okay? They're pushing out, they're moving apart. Move, 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 move. And gravity is something that he wants to pull her back. She wants to pull him back. They are moving out. So eventually you would expect they would get out where it gets taut, and then they would start pulling each other in. Pull in, pull in, pull in, and they would come back together. And that's what a lot of people thought would happen with the universe. The universe would expand out, and eventually gravity would take over and pull, grab, 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 pull you back together, pull, pull, pull you back together, boom, they come back together, right? But what is actually happening is they start moving apart, moving apart, and instead of gravity slowing them down, there's some mysterious force that we call dark energy, which is pushing them faster, faster. I'm pushing them faster away, more than gravity can pull them in. And we don't know what it is. We call it dark energy, we don't know. But gravity should pull them together, pull, 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 and dark energy is pushing them, pushing them, pushing them apart, okay? <laughs> we don't know what that is, right? So I can show you, I can show you what it is, but scientists write papers about what this is. They wanna know. We wanna know. It's actually up to you, the next generation of scientists, to figure out what the heck is pushing everything apart in the universe. The stuff in our bodies are being pushed apart. The stars, the galaxies, everything are being pushed apart. Okay, let's thank our volunteers, Ryan and Maddie. Thank you. So that's accelerating expansion. As I mentioned, this pushing things apart is going to end up in the big rip. Everything will be torn apart, but it's long, long, long in the future. We want to know how long. We want to know all the properties of this, okay? So this is all up to you, as I mentioned. I talked to you a couple of fascinating things about the universe, but this is really, there's things, I mentioned dark energy, I mentioned the expansion, I mentioned the big rip. There's also the Big Bang, there's dark matter, cosmic voids, all sorts of crazy things out there. That's up to you to try to figure that out. Work with us. We will train you to learn about these things and you will train the next generation. It's a fascinating area. Work in science, I really encourage you to do that for a living. It's a fantastic career. So I'll stop there and I'll take any questions. And thank you very much for your attention. I was just going to say, there is a microphone right down here in front. If you guys would actually like to step down and ask any questions, um, you know, feel free. If you've got some questions, come on over here. You guys can start moving forward. Actually, it was funny. He mentioned um, the red light, that element when the stars are getting further away. A good way to remember that, too, is think about a sunset. It's the exact same concept as to why we start seeing the yellows to oranges to reds in a sunset. So the further away that light is getting from the sun, we're seeing that part of the spectrum. So that might help you guys remember that, too, when it comes to those stars. Yeah being further away. Feel free to come on down, guys. Microphone right there. Go ahead. Uh, do you consider, um, in your job, do you do anything other than physics? Um, I get, in, as doing physics, we get to do many things. We get to do computer programming. We get to do electrical engineering. We get to do, do um, working with gas pipes and fluid mechanics. So all sorts of different things are wrapped up into the experiments that we get to do in the laboratory. And um, one more thing, will stars be ripped apart first because they're made of plasma and their um, atoms aren't connected? I think, well, they will certainly be torn apart. Sort of everything will be torn apart, we think, at the same time. But that's the kind of question that scientists want to ask and want to do these sort of investigations. So that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Do you guys have a theory about what dark energy is? There's lots of ideas about it, but most of the ideas are either very mathematically based and they don't have a physical meaning, or they are sort of a qualitative idea, a kind of a picture idea of something called negative pressure. But a negative pressure like something pushing out, but to say, where does that negative pressure come from? We don't know that yet. Thank so, you. Yeah, good question. Do you guys know what source dark energy is coming from and what is like the source of pulling the two matters apart? Yeah, I wish we knew what it was. There's a thought that there is a set of energy that is sort of a baseline energy for the entire universe. And dark energy is sort of tapping into that energy to push things apart. But we don't know the nature of that sea of energy, sort of like water in a warm bathtub that can be drawn up and used. We don't know the source of that and we don't know how much energy there is. Thank you. Yeah, great question. 
When did you find the sub substance of a dark energy? What led you to believe there is dark energy? Uh, so before 1998, no one was talking about dark energy because there was an observation in 1998 about this, this of these stars moving apart at very large distances. That first got people starting, talking about pushing apart and they called that dark energy. Then in 2003, there was another observation dealing with the heat of the, uh, from, the rem from the Big Bang, left over from the Big Bang, that confirmed that. And so people talked even more about dark energy. And now that's been 15 years, and we still don't know what it is. is so maybe any, you can help find out. Is there anything else combined with dark energy helping this? Is there anything? Anything else combined with dark energy? Or is this dark energy by itself doing this? Uh, well, there could be multiple components of dark energy. Right now, we kind of lump it all into one. So we sort of take all of our ignorance and shove it into a term called dark energy. <laughs> So, but hopefully maybe you or one of your, co one of your friends here can figure out what that is. Um, say that it's all expanding, right? It's all expanding. That means there's a middle. What exactly is the middle and shouldn't have it already, with all this pressure of everything expanding, shouldn't have it already been ripped apart since it's in a circle? That's a, that's a good question. It turns out from Hubble, Hubble's measurements that anywhere is equivalent to be the center. So you could be the center. I could be the center because everywhere you look, you see something expanding away from you. Everywhere I look, it's expanding away from me. Hubble, doing his measurements in Los Angeles, didn't have any preferred location. So everybody is the center. So you can go away from this lecture thinking that I am the center of the universe, and you're right. But also, he's the center of the universe, and you are the center of the universe, and you are the center of the universe. Everybody is the center because there is really no unique center. That's why everything's yeah. going to rip. Yeah. Do you guys have a time span of when the universe might be ripped apart? Oh, boy. That is, that is a really good question, and that's what people, people are trying to estimate what that would be. From, from the beginning of time to now, we think it's been about 14 billion years. We know it will be a lot longer than that to the big rip, but we actually don't have an idea. Maybe it would be 10 times that, maybe it would be 100 times that. We just don't know. We'd love to find out. What's the difference between dark energy and dark matter? OK, so dark energy is this thing that pushes apart. Dark matter is something that when they look up with telescopes, they see that most stars give off light. But they also see the way stars move in a galaxy kind of move around, that there's something there holding the stars in and making them go around in a circle, orbit the center of a galaxy faster. They call that dark matter, dark because they can't see it, but matter because it works by gravity. So that's a very simple explanation, but it's not the normal stuff that we're made of. Okay, um, when the big rip happens, what will happen to all the stars and the planets? To all the stars and planets? Oh, sorry, they're gonna be gone. Not only that, you're gonna be gone. You're gonna be gone. Everybody's gonna be gone, pushed apart. That's the scary thing about the big rip, but we really wanna try to understand it. Sorry to ruin your day. <laughs> Speaking of the multiverse theory, does that mean that we create a new universe every time we make a, a new choice? Uh, that's a little bit different, but the thought is that we are actually, our bodies and our atoms and everything are existing in a current universe, and there may be parallel universes that are totally separate from us uh, that are, maybe you're in that universe a little bit different, maybe, I don't know. Uh, we just don't know that, but I think in our given universe, sure, at every time we make a choice, I make a choice to walk left or walk right, uh, but I think most people thinking that is persisting within the same universe. At least I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and moderators, you should look at the timing, because I'm not watching the timing at all, so you can, you can moderate it. I... Okay, great. Um, do scientists know what triggered the Big Bang in the beginning? Do we? Know what triggered the Big Bang? Oh, that's a great question. So in the standard Big Bang model, you cannot ask the question that you just asked, what happened before the Big Bang? What triggered it? But of course, people don't like to be told, I don't want to, I can't answer that question. So people do ask that question. Imagine that there is a bathtub full of water. You know when you take a bathtub and you slap on the surface, what happens? You get waves, and then sometimes you get a crest coming up and some spray comes up, right? So there's some people that think that the universe before, not the universe, that something outside of the universe 
is like the sea of energy. And something is, quote, physicists call it perturbing, but I might call it slapping the bathwater, <laughs> that some spray might come up, and that spray might have enough energy. Imagine if you hit a drop and it just goes, and it falls right down, back into it. Imagine if you hit, the hit it really hard, and a drop comes off and splashes you in the face. Maybe if the drop comes up fast enough, it starts a new universe. So that's one idea. It's called the quantum foam origin of the universe. Fancy name for a bathtub full of hot water. Thank you. Yeah. Just an idea. So. I know I've already taken my turn, but I have one big question. Um, have you considered that when the Big Bang happened, um, it might be expanding because it might keep expanding because of inertia? And the reason it, it's accelerating faster is because of the heat is expanding everything? That's right. Come up here and I'll show you why. If you dare. I do. <laughs> he does dare. Okay. So the basic, as I showed you before, the basic idea, when you're starting off in hot and dense, exactly the reason you said, because of the, the heat and temperature, that we are splashing apart. We're going fast. And yes, we have inertia. We're being pushed out. But gravity, on a long scale, gravity is going to pull you back into me. You're going to pull me back into you. So here, pull on me. So we're both going to come in and in and in and eventually boom together, okay? That was the old idea. But now we know that something is pushing you apart. We just don't know what it is. Thanks. Thanks for being brave. When the big rip happens, will everything in every universe rip or will there be This something? universe, this universe. And not just everything, not just this chair or this rail, but everything. The, the fabric of space and time will rip apart. Space will no longer exist at, at, the, at the Big Rip. Thank That's a kind of an, a weird idea. How can space not exist? But it won't exist. Okay. The current lineup is going to be the last of these questions, and then we've got some on note cards. Okay, so when you were talking about the stars moving closer and pulling apart, is it a possible that one day a star could fall in and we have two suns? That happens all the time. Yeah, stars will come and together and merge. And what happens then, usually there will be, as they come together, they'll circle and circle and get closer and closer. Some stuff on the outer edges will be thrown out in a cloud of gas and dust. And the stuff in the middle will come together. Sometimes it will end up in a very big explosion. And sometimes it will come and merge, and the merge will be a little bit quieter. So there are all types of those stellar mergers. There are some people whose career is just to study the merger of stars. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is the dark energy the reason why the, um, the lands and the earth got split apart? Uh, so dark energy on the scale of me or you or the earth, the earth the Earth seems big to us, but the Earth is actually small compared to the size of the universe. So dark energy there is not pushing things apart so much. That's more dealt by gravity because we are kind of close together. Um, but on the scale of galaxies and, and tons and tons of galaxies and the whole size of the universe, that's where dark energy is really dominating. So most people think the, the scale of dark energy isn't affecting the things that are happening right here on Earth right now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the whole universe is made of atoms. Was the atoms caused by the Big Bang, or were the atoms here before the Big Bang? Uh, so the idea in standard theory is that nothing existed before the Big Bang. All the matter and energy in the universe was at one point, and then poof, came out. Okay, and initially that was all in the form of energy and not particles. But then some particles started to what physicists call freeze out. Some particles tended to be made because energy and matter can transfer back and forth to each other by e equals mc squared by Einstein's equation. So energy can transform into particles and particles into energy by certain processes that we know about. And as time went on, more and more particles were formed and then joined together to form molecules and then wonderful us. <laughs> do, your, do you yourself believe in the multiverse theory? Uh, theory? I think it's a fascinating theory. I think the idea that, just like thinking that there's only one planet out there, people used to think there's only one planet, now we've actually discovered that there's many, many planets around many different stars. And so I'd like to think that someday we could have an observation that would prove 
that there's more than one universe. And maybe you or your friends out there will actually make that. I, I do believe it's true, yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there any physical or mathematical evidence for multiverse? Ah, uh, there isn't any uh, physical evidence. So mathematically, there are some reasons why some theoretical physicists think that it's more likely that there would be a multiverse than just one universe, but there's nothing proven. So right now it's all speculation, but they're looking for ideas about some sort of what they call as a signature, some sort of observation they could make which would show that there is something beyond our universe. Right now we can't think of what it is. Okay. Thank you. Why do you call it a Big Bang? Ah, well, it's that of the largest explosion in the whole universe. Of course, there isn't any sound associated with it, but if you were there kind of outside and listening, it would be a gigantic explosion. And in fact, the term Big Bang was meant to be a joke because when it was first proposed, people thought that it couldn't be true. And then the name stuck, and then people started to like the name. Thanks. So. Couple of anonymous questions. Oh, okay. Um, what is the general theory on wormholes with different dimensions? So, what is a what is a wormhole? A wormhole is you have a black hole. A black hole is a big star that collapses down into what's called a singularity, big mass and no volume. And the thought is that maybe a black hole here and a black hole here could be connected by something called a wormhole, which is some sort of tunnel through space and time. They're hypothetically uh, I mean, they're just hypothetical right now. We don't have evidence for wormholes, but there is a thought that wormholes can allow you to, if you were able to go inside a black hole, you could maybe traverse a large distance in space and come out the other side. And the idea about different dimensions is that the current theory is that space has 11 dimensions, and they're sort of wrapped all up together, and we can only witness four of them. Three dimensions in space and one dimension in time. So could there be multiple dimensions in these? Yes, they could be evident in these. We think the extra dimensions are there all the time, but they're not evident. But maybe in a wormhole they could be. Okay, and Good will, question, whoever asked will it. Will dark energy eventually become stronger? Yes, in fact, dark energy is getting stronger all the time, and that's one of the very perplexing things about it. Dark energy is winning over gravity more today than it was yesterday, and tomorrow it'll be even stronger, and we don't know why. Very perplexing. Okay, the last one, what is relic radiation? So relic radiation, wow, that's a great question. You guys have really studied up. Okay, relic radiation, a relic is something that early in the universe, say it's very hot, and you can make some particles, maybe some very unusual particles or radiation, and then as the universe cools down, maybe some of these particles can still be floating around. And maybe somebody on Earth will build a detector and some of these particles or radiation will go through it. And that allows us to, by measuring something now, we can tell about something that happened very early in the universe. And that's called either relic particle detection or relic radiation detection. And there's a group of scientists who, again, spend a good part of their career building detectors to try to measure this relic radiation. Fantastic questions. Thank you so much. Thank yourselves also for participating and asking the questions. <laughs>